uh, unless your look is a squeegee boy, right? You shouldn't look like a squeegee boy on camera. You got to take it seriously and you will perform much better. Yeah, that is true. And you were doing this with two toddlers. Mm -hmm. Ex yes. Explain how that is possible because I have trouble with my three cats. <laughs> oh, look. Look, it's, the idea is as long as you have one right hand to type in and to juggle the kids on the left hand, you, you can do it. It's very possible. But otherwise, um, I figure out, thank God, now they go to daycare. This is very <laughs> exciting. Like, like, it's like the biggest explosion ever. And, and, and throughout, the co throughout halfway through the, the COVID year, I already got help and uh, and a nanny and all good. But for the first six months, it was quite a strange adventure. It was a negotiation with my wife. Could I get this amount, this block of focused work, right, that you can't distract me? And I will give you the same thing. I, my wife is a businesswoman. Also, I have two girls. I want, I want my kids to see strong women in my house. So I'm really mm. not trying to, hey, I'm the man. I need to work. We are both equally. So the rule is that, that you give me a block of five to six hours of undistracted work. And then there's I leave the, 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 extra, the suppliers and the people that I don't mind being distracted on while taking care of the kids. I, may, I make phone calls. There's also, I've, I discovered this incredible apps that actually educate my kids. So not sitting there in video, there's like this app called ABC Mouse, Sesame oh, Street, yeah. a, great, a, a great tool. There, there, is, there is several apps that if you just give them an iPad and, don't let, and just put those apps, don't let them get into anything else, they might come out of it more educated. My, my, my elders start learning capital A's and small A's and everything, and I was like, Hey, I, I'm not such an evil parent, you know? It, it really <laughs> no, I mean, that's the way people are learning. I mean, that's the way kids are learning nowadays. Uh, I am very well versed in ABC Mouse. So, yeah, like, the, yeah, that's... ABC Mouse all the way. I all like them. The way, way. All the way. <laughs> we do have a question um, from the, li the listeners, watchers. <laughs> I'm going to say listener. <laughs> um, uh, question from Emily. How do you avoid procrastination when you work from home? That's a good one. That's a good. Ugh. So, so I I always ask I always ask how do you avoid procrastination when when you're in the office? I mean the the the, the research shows that uh, a person in an office produces two hours and fifty three minutes in an eight hour shift. So the concept that you walk into the office and you type something on your keyboard does not mean that you actually produce something. But yes, at home it at home is very much a challenge and i really do deal with that at home like well, like i mentioned um the the block of undistracted work is really important i actually believe in writing down notes at the end of the day what is your mission for the next day and you literally when you take care of the kids when you get well now i have daycare so life is good i drop them off one day my wife does but even when i drop it off i go directly to the computer with a mission to finish that task and no emails, no no social media, no nothing. I had that goal from the day before. And you just and this technique you just crank through through the work and your entire day becomes more productive. Now, social media is one of the biggest distractors that people want to sit at home and there's no boss to even look. Usually you need to kind of turn your sheet into Excel sheet to to fake it like you're working, but exactly. here you don't even even here you don't even need to do that. So really um app blockers are really really great assuming you want to be productive if you don't want i i can't help you but if you want to be productive the uh, the the app blockers that apple has the every every uh, it's really you google for the best ones at this moment and um the fact that even if you can break it in two seconds and hack it in two seconds the not two seconds two minutes the two minutes that requires you to go and to remove that website and to remove the app and everything is enough to give your brain um, power to say, whoa, 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 you got to get back to work. But if you actually made it to the social media, you're significantly more addicted and it's hard to disconnect. So, uh, so app blockers are huge. 
and and they seem silly, but they're really really great. And of course, there's many other suggestions in my book. I mean, to I do can right. stop any time. What are you talking about? I, no, 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 it's direct. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> no. Candy, but I like candy, your suggestion. Candy. I like your suggestion about laying stuff out the night before. That's actually how I get myself to run every day. I put all of my clothes out the night before, and then I start putting them on as soon as I get up. That way, I feel stupid if I don't run, but I have calf compressors on. It it, so. it really is the same. Exactly, it comes from the same place. This uh, I learned this technique from the from the workout where they suggested put all all your clothes, all your tech watch, everything ready for a workout. Right. Although these days I work out through virtual reality, it's a completely different experience <laughs> by itself. I I go into boxing matches for VR, remote style. I do everything remote style these days. But uh, <laughs> but yes, it comes from the idea that if you prepare everything the day and you just go like into the computer as a mission, I'm gonna kick that project's butt. You will kick that project's butt. I love that. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, and I, I do think that there are going to be a lot of places that aren't going to have people come back to the office the same way now that they know they don't have to. So I think this is really important. I'm actually I am very excited to read the book because, you know, even though I've been doing it for so long, there's still stuff that I, I could learn about it. There's a huge amount of stuff, and, and one of the things, first of all, just to point out that there's so much research that shows that remote work, remote workers are significantly more productive than the, uh, the than their office counterparts. You have to understand, in the office, there's so much distraction. Every time somebody tap on your shoulder and have a chit chat and good time, that takes 25 minutes to come back to focus. That's why they're only producing two hours and 53 minutes, right? So you the there is no reason why a company would not actually own on the concept that they're going remote, but they're just new, used to it mentally. They need the next generation to, to accept that. Amazing. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for talking with us and you should check out surviving remote work. Um, and uh, thanks again. Have a good day. That was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Hey. Um, and I will let you know the winner um, for Star Wars Psychology. The closest guess was Deborah at 312. Um, and every, they will get all your info over the chat. Um, the actual number of pages is 302. So that wow. was the closest guess. Congratulations. That is uh, awesome. And let's bring in our next author. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, How are you ladies Hi. doing? <laughs> Doing good. Look you guys have me laughing <laughs> since the beginning. I love it. Oh, that's, oh. Awesome. that's awesome. Thank you. So you got some really cool kids books. I and do. I want to know about them because I have some kids in mind for these books. Nice. Well, the first book that I wrote um, is called Hey Jasmine, Let's Go to the Park. And this is about my daughter. She has cerebral palsy and wears leg braces. And really, I'm a teacher by day. So the teacher in me wanted to educate kids on about cerebral palsy, but the mama bear in me wanted to not hurt a child and wanted them to act right when they played with my child. Right. <laughs> right. You're like, and educate then, yourself. Right absolutely. Here. <laughs> <laughs> to give the parents that are so stuck on their phone an opportunity to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> especially yeah. with COVID right now, like this is perfect because yeah. kids are so excited now to be around other kids. They just want to, you know, interact and, you know, introduce themselves. So this allows for parents to talk to their kids about cerebral palsy, how to include special needs kids when they play. Like they just want to have fun, too. They may be a little different. They, you know, uh, noise might affect them or, you know, whatever. But they just want to they want to have fun. They want to be included and they want to play. So that's. That's the first book. So this is very dear to Such an heart. important I, message. Very right? important. Message. I love that yeah. so much. Let me show you, Jasmine. Now, she, she's not here with me today because she, this is her weekend. So she gets to be with the grandparents. But oh. this is my lovely baby. Oh, my Aww. God. Oh, my God. <laughs> And no one had to tell her to put her hands on the hips. To, oh my <laughs> to God. Post it. It's natural. I She's perfect. I, I love, love it. it. I love and so it. the second book that I wrote is called Daddy Daughter uh, Q&A. 
And this just celebrates the relationship between fathers and daughters. And so as you can see from the cover, um, we have a variety, a variety of backgrounds, um, step parents, uh, fathers that have infants all the way to me, my sister and my dad um, who inspired the book. And so it's basically just different fathers and daughters answering questions about the relationship. How do they spend quality time together? Um, how do they get through those tough moments and still have a relationship? So, you know, with Father's Day coming up, just saying, you know, great, great wow. handbook. <laughs> I have to tell you that is so great. Um, my dad made me promise when I went into acting a thousand years ago that I was never allowed to pose for Playboy. And I was quoted, one of my interviews was quoted in Playboy once. And so I, I did need to mess with him a little. And I was like, oh, guess what? Yeah. yeah, that was that was mean. I should not have done that. Oh, but you have to mess with him every once in a while. That yeah, makes for a good to. story though, right? It does, it does. does. I'm like, no, no, not really, dad. Just just my name, just my name. I mean, these both of these subjects are so important. I mean, the dad question one it hits me so much. You have no idea, especially today of all days for me. Um, oh. It's the anniversary of my dad's passing. So I'm like, oh my God, I got a little choked up. It's amazing. Uh, but like, yeah, the conversations that you have with your dad, especially as a woman, yes. define so much of your life. So that is yeah. such an important book. And I'm so glad you you did that. Um, we do have a question yeah. for you. Sure. <laughs> um, Eileen from Texas said, how can parents instill in their children the love for books and reading? Oh, yeah. You know what? You have to find a book that speaks to who they are. So mm -hmm. if they are adventurous, find an adventurous book. If they like to cook, start with a cooking book. Um, if they like to dance, find a book that's about dancing. So that way, when they're reading the stories, they can connect to it. And then, you know, the teacher in me thinks, make it an activity. So have mm. them act it out, you know, have them do a puppet show instead of just reading it, you know, make silly voices. So that way they are encouraged to do it. And so if, you know, reading the book in person takes a minute, start with some online videos. That way they have a visual of it moving and then have them create stories. And then that will inspire them to be more engaged when they're reading. I love that activity thing that you said, because I actually, I am such a huge reader, but when I was a kid, it took me a little bit, a while to learn how to read because I was dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And I had a teacher that would give me a stuffed animal for eat with each of the books and I could mm -hmm. have it for the week while I learned to, you know, like read the book. And mm -hmm. so like, I, that is such a good, I mean, like, <laughs> it's it, like, it speaks to me so much. I love it. Um, <laughs> activity. Yeah. Like, Give oh, absolutely. To look forward to about, about reading. Yeah, I had a amazing. teacher that when we learned about slavery or if we learned about Native Americans, she would have us actually dress up just like that. She'd cut the lights off and she'd turn the room into the slave trade or turn the room into a powwow. And each kid got to, you know, pretend that they were one of the, you know, famous, you know, uh, historians, whatever, and talk to the class as if they were that person. And so it just drew us into it. You know, kids that didn't want to learn about history, like, oh, really? What happened? Oh, okay. So, you know. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a teacher once who had us do, we could pick an art project to go with whatever book we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, and I did a, it was supposed to be a tapestry. I drew it. I did. I don't leave. <laughs> So, but, okay. you don't? but it was really fun. I mean, <laughs> but it was, but having activities, I love that idea because that really makes a difference, particularly if you've got somebody who's not quite as into it. I also find that comic books are a good way in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, I, is there, oh, oh, sorry. Is there any, no, um, okay. any tips you have? Because I know a lot of kids are going back to hybrid learning right now or going yes. back to see friends for the first time and maybe meeting new students, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So any tips that like parents can start with with their kids to be accepting and understand that everyone's different and everyone's awesome? Absolutely. So we just went back on campus just the other week and I said hi to a student and they were tunnel vision, zombie mode. <laughs> They're so used to ignoring me on camera. So the first thing I would say is talk to, 
I'm telling you, <laughs> they just ignore you, right? I have a screen full of names, not beautiful faces like today. And so they're so used to not having to respond or engage with eye contact. You know, they're used to a mask over their face, so they're not used to mm -hmm. having facial expressions. So the first thing that I would say is start having conversations with your kids and say, no, look at me when you're talking to me. Let, let me let me really, you know, see that you're paying attention or let's just do a practice run. Let's go say hi to this kid. And if you do it with them, just to kind of get their nerves, you know, kind of relaxed, then once they're back on the school campus, it's a little bit, you know, easier <laughs> versus just, no, if I don't look at you, you don't see me and I can just <laughs> go straight <laughs> beeline to the door. <laughs> I love that. So that is amazing because I've wondered yeah. that with yeah. with kids, even since Fiona just said hello. That's me. Yeah. I wondered that with pets too because you know I walk down the street and I'm like, doggy, they can't see uh -huh. the smile. I no. was confused about that, like how how everybody is going to react to being able to see real facial expressions again. Right. And you can even, you know, um, have them practice like different hand waves. I tell them if my eyes start to disappear, you know, I'm smiling. My cheeks are going mm -hmm. up high because <laughs> yep. That's because you learn the smiles, <laughs> the smiles we oh, learned yes. from Tyra <laughs> was everything that we needed to learn for the pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. I was glad I, I'm glad I didn't get Botox during the pandemic because <laughs> if I did, you wouldn't be able to see that I was smiling. So... Jenna, we're going to work on your smiles. I, I, well, and now that I have mine, so you can tell. It's cool. <laughs> but I, I just would, I would I just have them talk. work on body language. So, you know, what does happy look like? What does sad look like? What does, like, your interested look like? You know, just body language. I think that's yeah. just a good skill anyway, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. that's a great tip. No, it really is. And I, I think, because I think a lot of us have started doing the wave when we pass people now. Like, <laughs> I'm really looking at you. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Other people in existence. Yeah, I think that's it, body language is so important. I think it makes you such an empathetic person, too. Like mm -hmm. when you kind of look at somebody and go, what's going on with them? What are they trying to convey? What are they hiding? <laughs> I'm just kidding, unless you don't know. <laughs> And you know, and having a special needs daughter, it makes you more sensitive to how people react to different behaviors and body language and sounds. So I, th I just think it's a, a great skill for all of us to have. That's Absolutely. awesome. I know who I'm sending these books to. <laughs> Very excited. Thank Amber, thank you so much for coming thank on today. So much. Thanks for having You're me. You're awesome. <laughs> Bye. 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 Wow. All okay. right. I know. I love this. Now I have all these books I have to buy. I know. So many, so many books to buy. So little time and so little space on my massive book. Well, we'll get another shelf. Uh, we'll get another shelf. Uh, <laughs> let's bring in our next author. Hey there. Hello, Hi. Jeff. Hey, good to see you. We are very happy that you're here. So and happy. we. We hear, so first of all, I want to say you're the author of the YA fiction um, books, including Mayfly and Scorpion, but also I hear, ah, oh, very nice. I hear you had a harrowing COVID experience. Ooh. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, unlike a lot of people who are, I spent um, pretty much all of February unconscious in the hospital with, with COVID. Um, oh. I came down with what felt like the sniffles and a week later I was in the ICU. Um, uh, I'm obviously maybe not the prime, the, like the normal candidate for, for, for COVID. I was really healthy until that time I was mountain biking like three times a week. And, um, like a week later I was in the ICU, was intubated a couple of days later and was unconscious for, for about three weeks. Um, so I was, uh, um, in a coma. Um, but my, uh, my wife, my wife and I, right before we started, uh, before I went in, decided to start kind of taking daily updates of what was going on just because we had people in our lives who, as I'm sure most of you have, who weren't taking it very seriously. And um, so I did it kind of initially. And then when when I uh, became unconscious, she she um, kind of followed up and, and started to, you know, kind of make updates from afar as she was trying to advocate for me. Um, and um, it was kind of crazy. I woke up like three weeks later and, you know, they asked, she asked me, you know, do you want to know how long you've been in the hospital? And I thought it'd maybe been like a week. 
uh, maybe 10 days. And she said, no, you've been here for like 20, 23 days or something like that, 24 days. Um, yeah, and but what was interesting was that um, while she was while, while she was writing, and these were just updates on Facebook, um, we had left them public and people started sharing them. Um, and when kind of I woke up, there were somehow thousands of people who were following along, um, people we had never met before for the most part. And um, it's pretty amazing. They, they, we were getting like care packages from Australia from people we'd never met. Um, and it was such an amazing uh, community uh, and really kind of helped me rally um, and, and to kind of supported her throughout all of this. Um, and so I've, uh, I've started, I've continued to write updates about all this stuff. Now I'm home, I've been home for about four weeks, but still, like I still have a hole in my neck, which is why I'm making this particular fashion choice. Um, and uh, I mean, it's closed, but it's still there and very visible. Um, and uh, um, and it, it's, it, it's interesting, I think as a writer, um, it was so important for me to be able to communicate this as quickly as, as much as I can. Um, when I came out of um, out of this coma, I still was really not able to communicate. I I had a, a trachea tube, uh, which I didn't even know had been put in, and I woke up and I thought I could talk and I couldn't. Um, and so I was um, almost as soon as they would let me, as soon as they uh, my hands were strapped down, so I couldn't really even gesture or anything like that. And as soon as they like unstrapped my hands, I asked for my computer and my phone and you know all my devices because it was really important for me to um, to be able to type and be able to tell the world what was what I was thinking. Uh, and, um, and that was really hard. It took me, I think my very first sentence I wrote on my phone, my hands were shaking so much, like I couldn't actually really hold the phone and they would, you know, in this, First of all, the keys are way too tiny on a phone anyway. Um, and, <laughs> but like, you know, I'm like, they're kind of like skittering all over the place. And it took me like an hour to write my very first sentence, which I was, which was like, hey, everyone, I'm alive and typing is stupid. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, um, but like, that was so important to me. Um, I, I just kept on working at it. The doctors said I thought I was, it was really too early for me to be attempting anything like that. But I think as a writer, it, gave me a way to a voice, but it also kind of reminded me of who I was, you know, it was sort of the, the way to get back to who, to myself again. Um, and, and so I had my wife bring in like a, a ergonomic keyboard so that my hands would kind of hold still. And, um, the tremors like kind of resolved themselves after really kind of weeks of, of typing. Um, so it was kind of like the best occupational therapy I could have gotten. Wow. That's incredible. That's amazing. Do you, I always wonder about this um, in terms, because I write a lot of nonfiction, but when you're, when you're writing, I mean, is this something that you, that you want to bring into future books? Because that's a huge experience. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually are working, my wife and I are working on a memoir to, together about it. Um, tentatively, it's called Love in the Time of COVID. Um, but it's really, I mean, when people are reading it, they, they kept on, saying this feels like this like very tragic love story um, because we had this really strong relationship and we were completely separated. You know, we couldn't physically see each other. Um, I was, like I said, I was unconscious while she was trying to keep the house, you know, keep every, everyone alive, basically here at home. And, um, and so between what she wrote and I wrote, I mean, sort of the amazing thing was that even right now, we, even without doing anything to it, we had like two thirds of a book already um, because there's just so much to talk about. So now it's kind of putting the pieces together. Um, and it's it's been really just life affirming to, to be able to kind of step back and look at this from, from a different perspective. Um, and it, you know, it's just something that that is so so much so kind of central to who who we are and to our relationship. Wow. Wow. Is that something that um, I mean, I know people talk about about illnesses being life changing. I've I've had something like that myself and i'm i'm curious do you think that you've processed all of it yet or is the book the um, thing that i feel that's like i feel like i'm waiting for the other shoe to drop um you know there's um i know that there was a lot of trauma um and um um and i keep on waiting for it to hit me um but weirdly i came out of this remarkably optimistic about um life about my chances of survival 
and I don't know. I feel like in some cases, like it's sort of like it's just that's all I had. That was my choice was to to hope or not, and I chose to hope, and it's something that's really stuck with me. Um, and I do think it is life changing. Um, you know, I'm I had been through some. We'd had some health crises before, so that was sort of where that initial change happened. But this really kind of sharpened everything. Um, has made us especially so grateful for the friends and the people in our lives, um, whether they're strangers or not. So, um, I, um, by the way, I do have like a, a little bit to read, but I don't want to like overdo it. So if we have more questions, I'm happy to ask that too, or answer that too. I, I can see one from the audience. Yes, yes, we do have a question from Jennifer from Texas. Um, is there any connection between the Hollywood in your books and the glamorous Hollywood we all know? Yes, there is. So Mayfly and Scorpion are both set in in um, LA and specifically um, really where I live. I live kind of at the base of the hills and um, they live in um, what's around, it's called Lake Hollywood. Um, and and it was kind of a fun thing, like language devolves in this book. This is set a hundred years in the future, but Hollywood originally meant the holy wood. Um, and so it was just sort of like a, a return back to what it was. Um, and the kids who live here, um, the people who live here um, have really kind of like the legends and the sort of almost religious beliefs they have are informed by Hollywood. So they think of like actresses and stuff like that as like goddesses and priestesses and things like that. So yeah, it is. Yeah. I love that. We have about a minute left, so I'm not yeah. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I think we'll that's okay. Um, that works for me too. Um, <laughs> Go on into Anastasia. Sorry. I, oh, I was just going to say as an LA local, I will, I will say, yes, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly how we, we pray to the gods. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's, it's something like the book series was something that was set very much um, in, in LA and felt as someone who loves LA, it was, there are all sorts of Easter eggs for people who live here. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. Oh, I can't wait to read them. And Jeff, thank you so much for being here. And I'm so glad that you're that you're out of the woods because that is just an unbelievable experience. And I'm just I'm and blown I feel away. bad about saying I can't wait to read about it, but I can't wait to read about it. I know, right? Like I yeah. wanted, because it's, I think uh, we understand it, stuff when we read about it. It was a pretty wild ride. I think it's worth it'll be worth a read. Um and um and it's certainly been um a really cool labor of love to work on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great to have you. Likewise. Hi. And uh, just so just so we all know, um, all the authors have a speaker page on the BookFest website with info and links and all of that. So you can find all their info there, which is, which is very cool. And Hello. next up, we have Hello. Karen Sloan Brown. Hello. 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 Good evening. How's everybody? Good. Can't complain. <laughs> good, good, good. Oh so my gosh, I love your background. Of, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the yeah. author of The Fortunes of Blues and Blessings. Yes, definitely. Yes, I am that author. It's um, it's actually kind of an epic story because it go it follows uh, five generations of this family, and so uh, the the kind of idea behind the book is. You know, we all have those, uh, I guess they call them the uh, physiological needs. So, you know, we have to eat, we got to have water, we got to have oxygen and warmth and all that. But then we have those kind of uh, our psychological needs. And so those are the ones that I kind of wanted to talk about in the book, like um, uh, our our need to, to be something bigger than what we are, to kind of grow, to mm -hmm. kind of thrive, uh, to be kind of safe to uh, live. And so it just kind of built on those things. And, and and so on that type of journey, we all have like blue, you know, um, ups and downs and rains and shines. And so that's kind of the title. It's kind of the fortunes, uh, blues and blessings of this family over this five generations and just their kind of ups and downs and their aspirations of trying to be, um, uh, better than who they are or something more or, or or as we all want significance and so it's like from the beginning of time it's just like a human thing that we all all of us have so I just thought uh 
since we're all on that journey, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it's interesting to kind of read about another journey, kind of take the, our minds off of our own journey, which sometimes is like uh, two steps up and then one step back. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what the book is about. Oh, that's, that's a- so cool. And Amazing. I know you wanted to talk about the Fisk Jubilee Singers Grammy win. Yes, because I, 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 I always like to add a certain historical aspect in, in, in my writing. And um, uh, I live in Nashville. And so the Fisk Jubilee Singers are really big here at Fisk University. And so I don't think they really had the notoriety so that they should have. I don't, and so I kind of put that in the book. One of the characters is kind of, it's kind of like a Forrest Gump type of thing throughout the story. So you have uh, characters that kind of mix into historical events. Mm. And so the worldwide tour of the Fisk, of, uh, of these Jubilee Singers, these Fisk Jubilee Singers was just like this big, huge thing at that time. And, uh, and so uh, they were like the superstars of entertainment because, they, I mean, what did we do back then? There wasn't a whole lot of different forms of entertainment in 1875. Right. And so they kind of traveled the world as these superstars and they went uh, to Europe and Australia and Asia. And, and just to kind of follow that that tour that they had. And one of the characters, uh, Diana, uh, when we talk about wanting more, wanting to be better, um, even after that tour, after that great life experience, after achieving your goal, then then you all of a sudden you get that next goal, or that mm-hmm. that you, you need that more. Your satisfaction just keeps growing and growing, and so yeah. then she went into vaudeville, which was kind of big at that time, and then of course then they had the Black Broadway. But it just you still, I guess that's how it is for all of us. We get a little bit of success, and then uh, and then you just want more. You want more. I want to do the next yeah. thing. You know, as you try to get to that point, when I get there wow, it's not quite of the thing I thought it was going to be. So then you, you know, you set that goal post a little bit uh, further then. So that's what it's kind of about. But, you know, we all have that uh, fate that kind of comes into our lives, you know, that um, uh, the inevitable or the unavoidable, you know, these circumstances that come in when we're trying to get to where we're trying to get to. And so that, that, that's kind of interesting. And so that's what I just kind of try to put in the book, the reality of all of us, um, it's just not a straight line to whatever we're trying to do. It's always a twist and a turn and a, a U-turn <laughs> and, and, and yeah. you know, just all kind of things like that. So that's what it kind of, it's just kind of a fun read to kind of, and a historical read and it's kind of family read. It's kind of a little romance. So I think, um, I think a book should offer you all of the above. <laughs> I love that. A little bit of everything for everyone. Yeah, a little bit for everyone. I mean, because we all kind of live the same life and we all kind of experience all of that, you know, setbacks, uh, a little love, hopefully, hopefully. (laughs) And so um, just all those different things that we all kind of experience. It's just good to look and peep in somebody else's window for a minute. Oh, I love, I love, (laughs) I love a good peep. Um, (laughs) We have a question from Joan in North Carolina. She said, what does Karen love to write most, fiction or nonfiction and why? Uh, well, um, I like to I like to uh, write fiction most. I have written um, some uh, nonfiction. I wrote a history book, and I wrote uh, also a kind of political commentary. But I love the fiction because you can just let your mind just just go. You can just sit, you know, just like kids. You just sit around and make stuff up, and you just kind of, you know, and it's like you even surprise yourself. You're like, oh, that was wow. They did, you know, it's like the the kids play the Sims game, and they're like, my daughter plays the Sims, and I'm writing. My my stuff over here. She thinks hers is so interesting. My 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 person. They just got a. They just went to college, and I'm like, yeah, mine's doing more than that. So you know, we just uh, it's just fun. You're like, and I also birthed one that's going to do all these things too. Yeah, 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 yeah. She had and she has hers. Hers did this on the Sims game. I'm like, okay, okay. My but mine did this over here. So it's just fun. It's fun to just kind of sit there and let your mind be free and Mm -hmm. just just write and just see where it takes. You. And you surprise yourself a lot of times because you're like, where did I get that from? You know, that was just, um, that fell out of the sky. Somebody put that in there. So it's kind of interesting. Do you, <laughs> do you find, do you find it, oh, oh, sorry. Well, we're saying no, go, the go, same go. Question. It's going to be the same question. Um, the same question. Do you find that you, <laughs> you tend to read mostly fiction or do you like nonfiction to sort of inform your fiction? Um, well, um, I did when I did the history book. I learned so many things, and whenever you're looking at different history, you learn all these different interesting facts and people and things like that. And so you almost want to 
create a story to make someone look at this historical event or to look at this or to look at. And so you kind of guide your story to talk about different things that you want to bring attention to. And so uh, and that way I'm kind of educated uh, when I read um, uh, nonfiction and I can actually take that information and share it with someone else in, in, in a fictional book. I love that. Do you find that in fiction when you're writing these uh, these characters, sometimes you know the character so well that they just kind of like, they they went off uh, off on a tangent and you're like, oh, I did that. Is that why sometimes you think- You do, you do. Yeah. And because once you develop a character to a certain extent, they become a person, a human being. And so it's not anything that I would do or that I might say, but you you begin to know them and an extent to where you know what that character would do. Uh, it might be out of my character, but it is in the character of the people, of the characters that you develop. And you have to be kind of free to let them be a little bit freer and say things. I'm a preacher's daughter, so it's like, hmm, you know, so you have, you, it's like, I would never, but you know, you have to be, <laughs> you have to be freer to let your characters be who they are and say what they would say and just, and just, and just be free in, in doing that. And don't feel like you have to um, edit yourself or what if somebody says something, you know, and you just have to, uh, you just have to write the story and write and let the characters just, just let them go. Be, just do their thing. <laughs> I'm just like, just kind of, you know, just let a story actually just comes to life when you really develop those characters. Well, the, it, it will um, propel your story, I guess. That's my little hint to the, to the writers. <laughs> Yeah, just let them just let them live. Let them live. <laughs> let them live. I love that. I mean, I think that's a big mistake that people make a lot is they they tend to censor what their character's going to say because they think yes. I would never say that. Yeah, yeah. I I I have done that and I and I stop myself. I stop myself mm -hmm. because sometimes if I use like a four letter word or something like that, it's like, hmm, you know, because I, I, I have to say, well, I can't allow my characters be judged in that way. Let them be free. Let them say what they want to say. Because, and, I, it, and it's just strange because um, I, it's just out of character. But I had, I had a, another book I wrote about romance, and, and it was just a wonderful book. And, so, and when a reader asked me, um, did the character use birth control? And I was like, I was huh. just so lost. And I'm like, who, what, you know, so I, you just have to not think about what other people would say, the, you know, it's like, it's a story, it's entertainment, it's, it's just fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> fun to figure out how other people might live in front yeah, of you. Yeah, I, I love mean, it's, it. it's I love fun, it. yeah, I mean, that's what we turn on TV, escapism, you know, a book yeah. is, you can't escape any better than in a book. Exactly. I love that. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. Oh, and thank you for the opportunity very much. And be sure to check out her uh, uh, author page so you can get all yeah. these amazing books. <laughs> um, I need so much money on books, you guys. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Amazing. Okay. So next up, we have Deborah Eckerling, author of Your Goal Guide. Um, speaker and founder of the Deb Method and Write On Online. Hello. Hello. Everybody. Oh my goodness. Hi. And I'm having so much fun listening to the other authors. So yay. <laughs> you guys awesome. are amazing. It's really good to be here. <laughs> this is so much fun. So tell us about the Deb Method. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's really my favorite question. So I, I I've been it. leading goal groups for years and about three years ago I went through one of those things one of my clients was going away and I said this is my opportunity to jump in with all of my feet into the thing that I love the most which is helping people figure out what they want and how to get it because you can't get what you want if you don't know what you want and so Deb is my system that helps people kind of wade through everything in their head figure out what they want, make a plan to turn it into reality. So DEB stands for determine your mission, explore your options, brainstorm your path. So you start with the foundation. What do I want? Why do I want it? How does it help others? Then explore your options. In what way does it manifest itself? Do I need to start a company? Do I need to write a book? Do I need to change careers? And then once you figure out that destination, you brainstorm your path. So write down everything you need to do. 
the, the little goals, the big goals, the benchmarks, the everything, and then you can make a plan to turn it into reality. Wow, I love that. That is really awesome. And um, I know you've got Write On Online, which is a community for writers, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Tell us a little bit about that, because I, I think one of the things, I know everyone talks about social media and it's get, it gets a bad rap, but I think it's a great place to find community. Well, it, and it really is. So I, I actually told my story backwards because usually I start with right on and how it kind of journeyed into the dev method. But I did events years ago for Barnes and Noble. Whenever I needed to fill my calendar, I just like hang out in the cafe and chat with the community. And one day someone said, would you start a writer support group? And I said, if people will come, I'm happy to try it out. And that really was what now my background is project management and communications, but that's really what started me on that goal path. And it was it was amazing to me because it was all about what did you accomplish, what do you need, what are your goals for next time? So as asking people in the group to do this, I did this myself. So I learned the power of goal setting firsthand. So over the years it evolved. I lived in Chicago at the time. I've been in LA for um a lot of years, restarted the live group in 2002, brought it online 2007, 2008, and over the years it's evolved from writers to, as you said, writers, creatives, and entrepreneurs. And I love my group because it's, everybody needs that rah-rah cheerleader, and it gets to be me, which is great, and the <laughs> others in the community. And, and so what I have is, so for the page, it's you can post your goals and report on your goals and you have the resources, and then, my the dev method has the videos and again me with the pom poms and this particular group every day there's a different thread that encourages people to share what they're working on so monday is networking goals tuesday is goal goals wednesday is blog share day my favorite is to your on thursday because love that everybody gets love to them. share their wins and photo friday and then what are you doing on the weekend and then sunday i share my goal chat so it's really it's not just about what you're working on, but you can meet other people and make connections. And you really can't achieve your goals on your own. You need your people. So I like to be in as many places as possible to help my people or join people or what, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Community is so important. And I love Toot Your Own Horn because I think sometimes we can be so caught up in like, the hustle and bustle and the negative feedback and all the stuff like that. And when you're forced to toot your own horn for a second, it's like, oh, I did accomplish something this week. Oh my God. I, you know, like I love that. Thank you. And it's really amazing, especially when I have the live group, people would, would come and they're like, I'm so glad you're here because nobody in my family gets me. Mm. And in this last year where everything has gone <laughs> online, you need it now more than ever is just people to be like, you're doing great, you can do it, that's wonderful. And I, in addition to my write-on group, I do have a group for my book, so people who are working their way through it can share their journey and ask questions as well. So I like to, uh, that's what people need. They need the hug, they need, the, oh, my prop. They need the gold stars. Oh! Because that's yes. what keeps you going. So it's it, it sort of like it, it calls back to the determine the first D in depth is determine your mission. But even before that, you need to visualize what is the life you want? What does that look like for you? And when you have that chance to kind of dream, when you give yourself the chance to dream, you're giving yourself a gift. It's like, you mean my life can be different? I'm telling everybody who's listening. Yes, <laughs> you just have to choose yourself. And that's the first step. I just, I just want to say, like, I, I'm going to reach over here and show you this because I love the gold star. This is what I use for my running so that I can, I do give myself stars because it worked in grade school. will work now. And, and when I have live groups or do workshops, it always starts with the gold star because you get one for showing up. So I love that. I, I'm, you're so my people. You're my people too, Anastasia. I mean, you're both my people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love it. We do have a question from Karen yes. in Illinois. How do you prior 
pri what? How do you prioritize? How do I prioritize my goals? I swear I could speak. Can I set up my personal and professional goals at the same time? So a, a, a double, um, if you could. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the second question first. Yes. Personal goals and professional goals work together. That's why when I was talking about brainstorm your path, write everything out. So you your goal is to become a best-selling author. So what you need to write a book. <laughs> you need to write a book proposal, you need an agent, you need to get your book published. And a lot, a lot of things. But in addition to that, you need to do things like set up your social media, set your platform, do your author page, start blogging, or however else you want to connect with your community and it, it really kind of whittles down to networking. You need to meet people because again, you need your people. So networking is a little bit of both a personal and a professional goal. The other part is if you're not living a healthy lifestyle, that personal goal is going to make your professional life better. If you're feeling better, you're more productive. If you're more productive, you're gonna be happier and your personal life's gonna be better. So they really work together and it, for, as far as prioritizing is concerned, it's start with the go back to your why. What do you want? Why do you want it? And, and how is it going to help others? Because when you have that fuel behind your goals, it's like it'll skyrocket. I mean, my my mission is to help as many people as possible figure out what they want, how to get it, and ultimately live the life you want. Very long mission statement. My motto is goal setting simplified. So everything I create, whether it's a workshop or my book or my community. It's all about easy instructions because making those changes is challenging enough. The instructions should be easy. So my answer, write everything down, then look at your life and see what you have time for. Set appointments with yourself. Do even if it's a little bit each week, that's better than doing nothing and build to create the life you want. And do you think people should write write it or I mean I, I know there's like kind of studies about like you know people put things on their phone or they or they type it. Is there something about like actually writing down these priorities or, or these goals that like do you believe in that or do you well I do believe in it, but I also believe if you're gonna type, you type. If you're gonna handwrite, you handwrite. It's finding the system that's going to work for you mm. is the one that's gonna be the most effective. Yeah, the writing down thing, that's the actual physical writing. That's the stuff that sticks in my head. So Right. And and everybody has their own process. And I even have I have the hack. Well, what if I don't like to write? I'm like, then talk it and then transcribe it. And then you can look at all the things that you're working on. I, I have this thing I call it directed journaling. So if you can't figure something out, you schedule three, four, five, fifteen minute sessions with yourself where you're just brain dumping the answer to a question or series of questions on a theme, don't read it. Then after three, four, five times, you can go through and objectively look at everything you, you put out there and find the common themes. And that's a great way to figure out your mission, what you want out of life, or to really narrow down your options to figure out what you need to pursue. Love um, I love that. What do you think is the biggest obstacle for people trying to reach their goals? themselves and, and, and is really it's the time thing it's mm. give we we need to set appointments with ourselves and by the way everything I tell people to do I do because I've seen it and I talked about how I created the dev method it fortunately my name worked with the system I had been doing That's convenient for years isn't that lovely how that, <laughs> that works happened? but <laughs> if you give yourself maybe you only have an hour a week make that appointment and put it in your calendar and don't let any, but okay, emergencies happen, but like 95% of the time, something that comes up should not sway you from an appointment with yourself. If you have to move it, you move it, you can't delete it. But the idea is to first really dig deep, to take the time to figure out what you want, because I'm all about setting yourself up for success. To take the time, figure out what you want, figure out what you need to do to turn it into reality, and whether it's 15 minutes a week, an hour a week, couple hours, make those appointments, do the work, oh, and write down the things of, as you've done them because if you're only doing a little bit of time each week, you're like, 
what have I done? I'm getting nowhere. But you can look in your calendar and say, oh, well, in this 15 minute session, I did this. Oh, and I did this. and I did this. And then you can be happy with yourself and extra motivated because you're seeing the progress. And that's going to keep you going. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it, I have, it goes back to like tooting your own horn and 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 seeing your progress, even if it's little, you know. Yes, and we should all you should always love what you're working on because no one's gonna love what you do. Can you tell? Do you think anybody loves goals more than me? I don't. <laughs> you you need to love what you're doing, and you need to like put it out there to the universe too. It's like owning the life you want makes it so much easier to go for it and just go for it because you can do it. I, I think everybody needs someone to tell them that, that you can do it. I think that's I'll really tell important. everybody. Because <laughs> you'd be surprised what you can do if you get a little encouragement. It, it, exactly, exactly my point. And it goes back to those live groups where people would come in and say, my family doesn't get me. And I'd be like, mm -hmm. come on in, you know, join the circle. Because we all, especially now, we have, whether it's a little extra time because you don't commute or a lot of extra time because you don't commute, or maybe you don't have any extra time to take that time for yourself, really hone in on what you want and turn it into reality. I love that. And you have hashtags too, um, goal chat and goal chat live. Yes. So every Sunday night I lead the goal chat, Twitter chat, at 7 PM Pacific. And it starts with sharing your wins and your goals for the week. And then we dive into a special topic. And then Monday, I do Goal Chat Live, and I bring in an expert to dive deeper into the topic or a panel. And then the beginning of every month, when we do our monthly goals, I have a goal party on my Goal Chat Live where I bring in friends from different parts of my life. And we just we chat, we share solutions, and it's just about that motivation and conversation. So it's, awesome. it's And then write on online Facebook group, and please follow me at the dev method everywhere and your goal guide. And if you go to yourgoalguidebook.com or go to my booth, you'll find more information. And if you're watching this, please connect with me because again, your network, that's like your secret weapon to achieving your goals because we need each other. Love there it. There you go. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. And have a great rest of the day. It's been amazing. You too. You too. And um, we are about to jump into our second giveaway. So the next book you're going to guess the number of pages in is another one I wrote for the Joker Psychology, Evil Clowns, and the Women Who Love Them. So I'm going to show you the side. Guess the number of pages, and we will we will mention five. the winner as soon as five. There's, there's a few more than five. All right. Well, you know. But that was good. That was a good guess. It was a good Thanks. guess. Thanks. I don't think I can win anyway, so I'm no, out. No, you don't, don't use mine or use mine, you know, see if we can win. Uh, <laughs> let's let in our next uh, uh, guest, amazing author. Um, I know he's raring to go because he's had a potato salad. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Bill Nick Sci-Fi. We are Twitter friends. You are very active on Twitter and it is wonderful. Yeah, actually, you and I are also Facebook friends. Yes, we think, are. And I think we're Instagram friends. I don't know. Yeah, I think we are. Are you yeah. official friends? Ooh, the shade. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, I no, don't tell we my... Are. I, I never tell my girlfriend about her because, you know, that would get awkward. Your girlfriend sounds awesome, by the way. <laughs> Kim is wonderful. Kim is absolutely... She's the reason I'm still alive, I think, sometimes. She is an amazing <laughs> human being. She's really wonderful, really wonderful. Love and I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I was, I've been listening along for the entire program here today, and I've actually gotten to the point where I'm confused, like, why the hell am I here? Because I'm not an uplifting, positive personality. My debut novel killed every man, woman, and child on the planet. And here I am, like, after that lady who's saving everybody's lives. I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. But, you know, sometimes you need that sort of, like, in your head just to know that, that the possibility exists. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> There's some kind of motivating thing in there. I'm gonna, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. <laughs> it's Do like I... starting over. It's like you have to rebuild. Like, yes. I, something like that. Something like, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I like that. I like that. So I want you to tell us about Bill Mix Sci Fi yes. and how you got that name. 
I got the nickname. Actually, I got to tell you another story before I can tell you that story. Okay. Because the first one leads to the second. Okay. In 2016, um, my book, The Brittle Riders, got released, the, the book one. I When I originally outlined the book, I figured I might be lucky to get 20,000 words out of it. I got a little over 300,000. So they built it into a trilogy. Azoth Kem was like, no, you are not releasing a 300,000 word book. We're releasing it in a tr as a trilogy. So book one came out September of 2016, right around my birthday, which was planned. That was their way of being nice to me. And um, immediately got bootlegged by a Russian site. And this is funny. We were selling it on Amazon to try and get people to buy it for $1.99. You know how they do those, hey, $1.99, here's my book, my ebook. Isn't that exciting? My ebook, yeah. Screw that. I'm never doing that again. Everything's 10 bucks and leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, um, so so we're selling it for a buck ninety-nine and it got bootlegged. Some guy in Russia paid a dollar ninety-nine for it, put it on his site, and started selling it for $3.99. And even got Daily Motion, the website here in America, to promote the fact that he was selling it for $3.99. And it's this son of a doo doo bop bop sold 35,000 copies of my book in Russia. Without my permission, never paid me a dime. And when we bitched, sorry, am I allowed to say that? Okay, I said that I anyway. So. Okay. When I complained to the Russian embassy here in Chicago and went through the food chain to get to somebody who actually could give me an answer, I found out that because my book complained, contained things that showed equal rights between the races, uh, support for the LGBTQ plus I, I, IA plus community, support for people who live different lifestyles, I'm guilty of sedition in Russia. So if I ever showed up in Russia, I would be arrested. That's right. I'm going to be arrested because my bootleg book that they did not pay me for doesn't meet their moral standards. And I have many middle fingers I could flip at them. So anyway, so. So you're on. a wanted man. I'm oh a wanted God. man. In Russia. Wow. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I mean, that's like, I hope that's Impressive. on your like bio for oh, all yeah, of your yeah. social media. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah in yeah. Russia. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am a seditionist in Russia, so that, that, as far as I'm concerned, that makes me cool. And now that Putin's been cracking down on gay people because murdering people is okay, but don't be loving the same sex. That's rude. Uh, Stupidly uneven. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you know <laughs> hey, hey, I don't make the rules. That's what they are. So I'm a wanted man in Russia. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, meanwhile the Brutal Writers, that, remember that book that I wrote that came out? Amazon put it in the erotic ghetto. Because on the cover of the book was a, a, an art gathering or art drawing by a gentleman named Jiba Mole Anderson. He's an amazingly popular artist. Uh, he's from the West Coast of Africa. He lives here in Chicago now. He teaches art at the University of Chicago. He is incredibly respected. And he's been a friend of mine since God wore tennis shoes. So he did the cover for my book. And it shows a beautiful African succubus on her knees with her hands around her chest and her wings pulled back and she's bald and she's, well, she's a succubus, you know? But because she had her hands around her chest, Amazon marked it erotica. Now, obviously, if you're looking for erotica and you see this book, you're probably not going to want it. And if you're looking for sci-fi, you're not going down to the erotica section where it has, and this is true, dino porn. So, yeah, you can actually, go, you, can, you and your velociraptor can do your thing. But my, I don't fit anywhere in there. So I'm okay without the Velociraptor, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, so <laughs> so they we went back and forth with Amazon, and they finally said, "Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. We 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 didn't need to put you there. Let's put you where you really belong." They put me in African women's studies. Now I've actually met Maya Angelou, and I think she's a wonderful human being, and I've had a drink with her. But Maya Angelou and I are not talking about the same stuff. I'm talking about the death of all men, women, and children and the start of a dystopian uh, new culture, and she's trying to save people's lives. Again, back to the beginning of the show, how did I end up with the nice people who are trying to save everybody's <laughs> lives? <laughs> so, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with Amazon. They finally put me in dystopian science fiction. Yay, that's right. <laughs> Problem is they removed it from my 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 Amazon page. Now on my Amazon page, it said I was writing books about sports, golf. I hate golf with a passion. Um, some guy had written a book about weird theology that I would have disagreed with everything on. Um, one of those right wing theology things. I just not not me. I'm a Sunday school teacher at a left wing church, so that you know, not not me. 
But anyway, so it had all this stuff that I never wrote, but it was attached to my name. And the reason it was attached to my name is because all the authors were named Bill McCormick. But my books that I had written were not attached to my name. And I had been in multiple anthologies by that point. So, there, I mean, I had like a little stripe that would have looked really cool if it was just me writing it. So it was cool. So I, I got mad. And I called Amazon. I called the 800 number and I beat, bounced through every single code until I found a guy. And I found a guy uh, named Patel who uh, was really nice and made me not yell because I was ready to yell at somebody. But he was very, very nice and he, he made me not yell. Um, he started going through the, the list. He's like, oh, well, I see the problem right away. They, they've screwed up the codes that go to everybody's name. And this should go to Bill McSports. This should go to Bill McTheology. This should go to Bill McSci-Fi. And I went, ding. Wow. <laughs> Mine. That's amazing. Seven days later, I had a website. I, I had the web domain. I had everything. And I made it a point really quickly to brand everything. So my Facebook page is Facebook Bill McSci-Fi. My Twitter is Twitter.BillMcSciFi. My Instagram is... You get the point. You, you get the idea here. So That's where you can find him. That yeah. Bill McSci-Fi. <laughs> and you should. You should. Totally. Well, thank you. I don't know why they should, but if they should, let them show. Your stuff is fun. Yeah. I enjoy your Twitter feed. It makes me happy. All right. Uh, I see I'm being asked to rap because uh, TL finally showed up, so... And then our private chats, Bill McSide. Oh my God! <laughs> you just no, but th that's blew cool. up our spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've ruined everything. Nobody knows that there's people working behind the scenes. They no, never would no have suspected it. that. It's there's a wizard behind the curtain. Don't. <laughs> the wizard behind the curtain. We won't even get into that. I'm going to say wow. something stupid, and I don't want to. It's, no, it's no, a, no. You already said of, vodka was a salad and that uh, in the private chat, and that makes me happy. So yeah. <laughs> Anastasia, Jenna, thank you very much for having me, having me. Thanks and uh, thanks for know, being here. Make sure you pet Desiree on the head because she deserves one of those. Oh. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. So we much. will see you later. And before we jump on with TL, I will just announce the winner of um of the giveaway. There are actually 366 pages in this book, and Sarah guessed 364, so maybe she has the book at home. Just throwing that out there. And uh, you can you can hook up with everybody over chat so you can figure that out. And now, let's bring on TL. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. So you have a book coming out called Good Looking. Tell us I, about that. So it is a murder mystery. Um, I'm a criminal defense attorney. Uh, by trade. And so, uh, you know, write what you know, I suppose. Um, I realize I'm not the first um, attorney who's tried to write a mystery. Uh, Grisham, Scott Turo. Never heard of them. They're hacks. They don't know what they're doing. Um, who's heard of them? Yeah. Um, but I do, I mean, I've tried a lot of homicide cases um, and sort of been on the front lines for the better part of 20 years. And so I think I have a pretty unique ability to bring the readers, you know, into the courtroom, um, into the judges' chambers, um, into the jails, um, to uh, you know, to entertain the readers and hopefully to educate them a little bit too. That's really cool. So, what was the thing that took you? I'm a little obsessed with law right now. I've been watching Legal Eagle. I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube, and now I'm I'm stuck. And I'm a little obsessed with crime. She is. No, sure. she really is. So. <laughs> So what was the thing that, that triggered the, the move from just, you know, from, from trying cases to writing? Um, well, I've always, I've always um, liked to write creatively, um, but the law provides zero outlet for that, right? It, it promotes uh, a lack of creativity, right? Because the law is the law. Um, and it promotes a very sort of turgid style of writing um, that, that over time saps <laughs> all the creativity from you. Um, and so when I finally, you know, stopped procrastinating and decided to write, it was fantastic. It was, um, like a, like really a, a breath of fresh air. Oh, that's really cool. Anastasia, I'm letting you jump in here because you are, you are the true crime person here. 
I, I mean, I thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I, no, no. I love it. I love it. No, I embrace it. I embrace it. But okay, so I think the thing I have to ask is, how is that defending somebody that possibly might be guilty? I know you probably get this all the time. Like, how? How do you do? How? 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 <laughs> right. Well, um, the, the the way the system is set up, right? everyone obviously deserves a fair trial right and there have been i think 180 people um on death row um convicted after a trial uh, proven to be innocent through through usually dna um and then released um and these are people who were convicted um you know found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt by a unanimous jury and so what that tells us is that we have to be extremely careful about that. And I'm part of that. Um, if, um, you know, picture the worst criminal you can think of who, who's committed the worst crime. Everyone has a mom, right, who cares about them deeply. And they come into my office. And if you can picture you with a loved one coming into an attorney and saying, help me, um, the last thing that you would want to do is for that attorney to say, yeah, you know, he sure looks guilty to me. I'm going to kind of, you know, halfway try. Um, and so that's the way I look at it. Um, cer certainly there are people um, that I believe are guilty that I have represented. Um, and those people um, deserve the best defense. And usually it doesn't work, right? Usually they're convicted. The jury system does a pretty good job of that. Anyway. Nice. And then I know I'm just curious too about about do you um, base any of the characters in your work on any of the cases you've had? Um, you know, I I I do. Probably like a lot of writers, um, I draw um, traits and idiosyncrasies of people that I run into, um, other defense attorneys or prosecutors or judges, and. Um, you know, sort of pick and choose these traits to form characters. So no one is is based on an actual person. That would be illegal, of course. Uh, but um, um, the protagonist in uh, my book, Good Looking, which I just happen to have a copy of here, available on Amazon. Um, it says six ninety nine on Amazon, but I think um, it costs like a quarter if you just yell at the screen and tell them that that um, I sent you. <laughs> anyway, I that's digress. how I shop. <laughs> so, so the uh, the protagonist is a criminal defense attorney like myself. Um, the protagonist in Good Looking, his name's Joe Turner. Um, he's a little insecure. He is a little bit of a smart ass. He stresses about his cases and drinks too much. Um, and right now, all my, all my friends are saying like, yeah, check, check, check. Um, <laughs> um, but the nice thing is that, um, you know, probably like a lot of people after a day at work, I think of all these brilliant things I could have said, you know, in court or, or otherwise. Um, think of a brilliant legal argument that I should have made. Um, if someone gives me a hard time, I, I think of the perfect zinger comeback, right? Um, well, this with the writing um, and having sort of an alter ego, it's fantastic because I can make him the most, you know, the, the, the wittiest guy. And in court, I can just, you know, craft these fantastic arguments um, that I have so much time to uh, to write. Um, and so I can make my little alter ego, Joe Turner, uh, a rock star in a lot of respects. So that's so that's fun. Awesome. Well, Teal, thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. Ha happy to be here. Thanks. Well, thank you. I have yet another book I need to read now. Yes, Thanks. more and more. <laughs> Bye, thank you. So, so next up, we have Celeste Duckworth from Vertical Media Group and host of A Taste of Ink Live. I just love that name. That's so awesome. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. Oh, good. <laughs> great, great. So tell us about the Lucy Project and how that came about. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, my, uh, I went to, when I was going to school, my degree was in medical anthropology and human genetics. 
Uh, and so my um, teacher thought it was just a weird combination. There weren't really any classes for medical anthropology. Um, and so he was having me write, um, you know, my opinion on different write, uh, uh, anthropology writings. And um, so I was sitting in the lab one day and wrote a short story. Uh, and the short story was about uh, the beginning of man and civilization in Africa and what would happen if if something happened in the near future and, you know, stuff like that. So nice sci-fi. And uh, my cousin was sitting there and I said, oh, look at this little short story I wrote. She's like, that would be a good novel. And I was like, nah, not really. <laughs> but I sat up all night and I wrote it and actually finished it. Um, and I actually got accepted into some creative writing classes from that. But it's a it's a sci-fi. I haven't uh, really finished it. I'm working on it now. But right now I'm enjoying interviewing authors from around the world on a taste of ink. Oh, wow. that's so cool. That's so cool. And the taste of ink is cool because it it intros writers, publishers, agents, book clubs, people who haven't been published yet, people who are already published. That's such a huge help for up and comers. So tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, because, you know, my passion was really writing. And uh, my husband at the time had a magazine. He's the first one that published me. Um, and then I was writing some poetry. And I don't know how, but ended up on a building in Phoenix. And um, at the time, I was just kind of like, you know, I wanted to know more authors. I was meeting authors. I was, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader, and I was like, why don't we have a program where we introduce writers to to uh, people? Also, because there's so many young writers coming up, and I said it would be great to find out, you know, how writers started and their different stories. And it's actually been very cool because we've had writers that wrote a book for four four years, and some wrote for ten years, and. You know, some have gotten, you know, just movie deals. And so it's been awesome. I actually saw a TV show with some writers that I had interviewed a couple of years back. And it was the most exciting thing for me. <laughs> I was like binge watching this program. Um, but so, you know, so my goal has been to, especially for um, individuals that love books, but maybe they can't get out and get books or, you know, like me, a lot of times I get introduced to a new book by hearing someone else tell me about it. So now I get to share all the books with people and the new books and, you know, and, and uh, let my audience know who's out there and who they should go read and, you know, and at the same time, get tips from writers. I always ask writers, what, was, what is your advice uh, to up and coming writers? And it's always great to to hear that, you know. So I think the one that really got me is I was I said, I asked one writer, I said, so what do you think about writer's block? And they said, there's no such thing. And I was like, dang, I can't even use that excuse no more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so great. Like that the community, you know, you get to hear from the community in different stages too, because I think, you know, like I am just starting on my journey of like becoming, a, a, you know, writing a book and stuff like that and hearing right. other people going through it and yeah. like at, at, at different stages is so encouraging and yeah. like uh, um, and seeing all the different walks of life that are coming to uh, be authors. I mean, that's such an important experience for everyone to see, uh, to see themselves kind of. Right. And, every, and no one really has a certain way of writing. You know, when people say, well, how should I get started? I'm like, go to my program and listen, because everybody starts different. You know, there's, there's the serious ones that do the outlines and I'll never do that. But, <laughs> but then there's others that just write. Uh, so there's no exact science, you know, um, and I love it when I talk to writers who are writing what they love to write about. That's great. Yeah. And I love I love that you talked about the difference of process, because I think sometimes people think it's wrong if you do it. You don't do it with like right. you know, you don't have a board with all the with the cards and all that. And if right. that's not you, it's OK. Right. Well, I, was not, I was not an English person uh, in my classes. And actually, when I had to submit 10 chapters to the creative writing program, I was like, oh, shucks. And uh, I submitted it, and the, and the teacher actually called me in for the summer and said, well, I want to talk to you about your book. And he said, 
you know, I would give you an A for this story. And he said, so you're going to get to write this book, you know, in your class. And I'm like, okay, cool. He said, but I would give you an F for grammar. And I was like, what? You know, and it's funny because a few years later when I took the book out because I was working, I said, let me take this book out and work on it. And uh, I was reading it and I was like, dang, Celeste, your grammar sucks. <laughs> That's what grammar well, you know, is for. <laughs> that stuff's that's the easier part to fix. Right. The grammar that that you can fix, but the right. but the creative stuff. And I I love that you said there's there's no one way because I know like I remember I was writing a book and I I had seen someone say like you have to sit down for eight hours a day and you have to go into your office and shut the door. I'm like I don't oh have a door. This is my office. <laughs> right. So, it's, I just, I just love that. I love that there's, there's so many different methods to do the same, what's essentially the same thing. Right, right. Well, I had Kevin Grow on my show lately, uh, uh, not too long ago, and he's a German writer. And I asked him, I said, so how do you prepare to write? You know, is there any schedule? And he said, no. He says, when I get off of work, he says, I have another computer that I do nothing but writing on. And I shut down the work computer and I take the writing computer. And I was like, dang, that's a really good idea. Great idea. <laughs> right. That's a really great idea. Oh, my God. Now I need another computer. Real. Yeah, it really is. I'm always I mean, like, when I get off work, I'm like, I don't even want to talk to nobody. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I agree with that. I'm like, I just need to go take a bath and watch Mary. Right. And please don't talk to me. <laughs> that's yep. right. That's yep. right. Uh, we oh, do we, have a question. Go ahead, okay. Gina. Oh, sure. Um, Janet from Alaska um, asks, where do you get the inspiration for your books? Well, um, my inspiration, um, oh my gosh, it comes from, I could be having a conversation with someone um, because I was in human genetics. Human genetics is a huge inspiration for me. Anything I might see on TV or, you know, I might hear about and I'll stop wherever I am and just write notes on it. So um, right now, I currently have three books in the making. So uh, I promised that I would get them published. But they're just they're just books from, you know, that's my inspiration. Um, I write poetry. My poetry is a little bit different. My poetry inspiration comes from just people, people I meet on the street, people I might be working with, um, reading about people or something like that. I had people used to give me... Um, little hints on Facebook and I used to write poetry like that. So it's more inspirational and empowering. My poetry is. Oh, I love live poetry. That's so cool. Right. See that, yeah. that makes me think of improv, which I'm very bad at. Anastasia's very good at it. I am uh -huh. not. Yeah. But, <laughs> poetry so was the way that I got, you know, poetry was the way that I reduced my fear of being in front of people. Um, of course, my husband got me into the radio program, but um, my fear of being in front of people, it was poetry. Um, my first poem that I wrote, that's why someone got me in a contest and they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, out of a million people in Phoenix, I'm sure I'm going to read, I'm going to make this poetry contest, you know, and I just procrastinated and bitched the whole time. And the day before I wrote the poem. <laughs> And then I and then I bitched all the way downtown to turn it in because I'm like I hate going downtown. I'm not gonna find a parking space. So so be it. I found one like across the street from the building, uh, and I go and submit it. And lo and behold, three weeks later, the city of Phoenix was sending me a contract uh, for the poem to put on a building. I'm like, and I told my mom, I was like, is this real? <laughs> my mom was like, yes. That's so that actually, you know, that really, you know, got me out. And I had some speaking engagement with kids that were writing poetry. So that even was even more inspiring. So, you know, that was part just part of what I do now. Amazing. Oh, uh, Celeste, thank you so much. That was thank so, you. that's so cool. Thank you. I, I'm <laughs> thank definitely going to check out uh, your show because seems oh, like there's going to be a God. lot of gold that I can reap from that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I I'm excited. Excited. When, you, when you get through with your book now, remember my show. So you oh, want to get yeah. in there. Oh, for sure. For sure. All for right. sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for having me. Okay. So next up we have Julian Reeve. Hi guys, uh, how you doing? Hello. hello. Lovely to be here. Nice to see you. Great show. Oh, I, I, I was just very happy just sitting here watching everyone. It's awesome. 
<laughs> oh, it's really fun. And you are the author of Captain Perfection and the Secret of Self-Compassion, a self-help book for the young perfectionist. I am a perfectionist. Help. <laughs> okay. yeah. Makes me. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a journey. So I used to be the music director for the Broadway show Hamilton. Um, and I was conducting the show in San Francisco in 2017. And I had a heart attack at the age of 43. Um, my right coronary artery was apparently 90% blocked. Um, and cutting a very long story short, the bottom line was that perfectionism was kind of deemed to be the cause of the attack. Uh, due to, shall we say, some slightly dubious lifestyle choices throughout my 20s and 30s that uh, was associated with my perfectionism. So I kind of got back to the show and made some changes. And, you know, I got heavily into the subject, did a bunch of research. Um, and I did a TED talk on the subject in 2019, and the kind of natural extension of that was to was to write this book. Um, you know, ostensibly, I believe that we don't, you know, we don't challenge perfectionism early enough. Um, I think kids uh, need an opportunity to manage their perfectionism in healthier ways. And self-compassion is proven to regulate the experience between perfectionism and depression. Uh, so learning those techniques early is, is a, you know, like it, that, all, all of that's super valuable. Oh, so important. So important. I mean, I, I know as I, I, I started acting really young and so mm -hmm. like I didn't have a lot of compassion for myself, I had a very big perfection problem. And learning in your late thirties, you know, it's a little bit more difficult. It would have been easier when I was younger. <laughs> sure, Ab absolutely. And you know, yeah. ostensibly, this book is the book that I wish I'd have read when I was a kid. Um, you know, it's your your point is absolutely valid. You know, the older we get, the harder it becomes to kind of get rid of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can put healthy uh you know techniques and methods in there early then uh you know we we we're, we're, we're going to be on a on a good road absolutely so um i'd also i'd love to hear your thoughts on perfectionism and imposter syndrome and the connection mm. there yeah i mean you know it, it's uh well how how would you regard imposter what what would you regard imposter syndrome to be well, I know, like for for me, if I um, if I desperately want to do something correctly, the first thing that pops in my head is how could you possibly do that? Why do you belong right. in this area? And right. I think there's so many of us that have that. Absolutely right. Um, and you know, the the bottom line with something like self compassion is that you know self compassion can teach you new language because all we're really talking about is rewiring. Uh, the, the hardwired stuff. And that's why it's so important to get in there with kids earlier on, because they haven't yet established all of these negative beliefs um, that, you know, we build up over time. Um, and yes, I mean, imposter syndrome and perfectionism are very, very closely linked. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey in terms of how perfectionism affects you. Um, and, you know, my research certainly says that, you know, we, we don't, we really don't understand enough about perfectionism, period, even as adults, because we we often, as perfectionists, value our perfectionism in some way. And when we value something, we kind of want to leave it alone. We don't want to kind of play with it. So that leaves us really vulnerable to, you know, all the nasty stuff like the anxiety, the depression, the burnout, the suicide, that, you know, the list is long. Um, and that's that's when it can get really tricky. Yeah. What tips do you do you have? Because I mean, I know people talk about this, but with when I think a lot of people also look for practical advice and like what would be the first thing you would tell someone? Sure. Um, I think for, for an adult, I would simply say start with the pros and cons list. Um, figure figure out how your perfectionism affects you. Um, write down how it serves you and also then write down how it um, affects you negatively. Um, then, you know, a simple kind of strategy to approach to approach perfectionism with is to prioritize so for example if you're the type of perfectionist like i am you know every email i send has to be perfect um but you're also the type of perfectionist that needs their fridge to be in alphabetical order and to be completely spotless at all times kind of consider which one of those two is more important 
um, and prioritize the time that you put into the more important one by taking away the one that is less important. So you're not necessarily taking your perfectionism away. What you're doing is you're just reapplying where you put the focus. Um, the growth mindset is huge with perfectionism because perfectionists often operate with a fixed mindset. You know, they we, we think that there's only one way to do things. If we're asked to do something, it's like it's my way or the highway. You know, there's there's no kind of team player here. Um, and, you know, just developing the growth mindset. Carol Dweck is a kind of leading psychologist on that subject. Her work is outstanding. So, yeah, it's it's knowledge. Knowledge is power with with everything with perfectionism. Do you think society's kind of put like perfectionism on like a pedestal? Like, I feel like it's almost like, how much do you work? How much do you do? How much do you do? Like, and, and like, can you speak to like how pop culture and society has kind of like put this like need for perfectionism on us? Or? Well, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I think social media has played a massive role in what we're talking about because, you know, comparison is constant. You know, whether we're walking down the street and we see somebody else or whether we're on a screen or whatever it is. And it can be at work or at play, you know, in relationships, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I, I think what's interesting with perfectionism, and this very much speaks to the work that I'm trying to do, is that, you know, society demands it. So therefore, anyone that is actually affected by perfectionism values it even more, which actually then leaves us even more vulnerable to all the stuff that we spoke about earlier on. So we, we haven't got the messaging right, actually. And I've just written a piece for Fast Company that kind of gets to this point. We need we need new messaging. We, we need messaging that actually, you know, let's really establish what perfectionism is, because psychologists have have a very good idea of what it is, but they're not necessarily agreed on what it is. And that filters down to all of us. You know, if you go on Google and ask for, um, you know, ask for the definition of perfectionism, you, you'll get many, many answers. And they're all kind of the same, but they're different enough for that to be a problem, I think. Um, so I, I think the I think the message kind of needs to be solidified um, and also uh, kind of marketed in a way that actually speaks to perfectionists and inspires perfectionists to actually get in there sooner rather than later to manage their traits in healthier ways. Nice. And we have a, a quick question before we wrap. Um, Queenie from New Jersey wants to know, how can I accept my perfectionism and make it work for me and not against me? Yeah, great. So start with that pros and cons list. So figure out which part actually works for you and figure out the bits that don't work for you. Simply that that uh, information to, to start with will will um, will absolutely help. Um, I, I think, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of what the, the, the work that we need to do as perfectionists is simply that it's like fi figuring out the parts that really don't serve you and get to the bottom of it. The absolute bottom of perfectionism, in my experience, is self-worth. It's all about self-worth. And it, the minute you start to feel valuable to yourself, and this is where self-compassion can help, um, you'll start giving yourself the love that you freely are able to give to others. Um, and many of your perfectionistic uh, kind of traits and behaviors will start to ebb away because you you realize that there's actually value in doing in doing that. I love that. I need this book. <laughs> I need to have we this all book. Do. And I and I know some young people that need it as well. So. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's been really good. I mean it was a great thing to do. First book I've I've ever written and the and the reviews are lovely, no least because all of the parents kind of say, look, I got so much out of this. You know, I, 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 it's, it's a kid's book, but it's not written. I haven't spoken down to children. So it speaks to adults in a very simple way, sure. But it's, it's still, the, you know, the, there's a lot in there that can really help a lot of, a lot of people, which is, which is great. It's been really fun to do. I love that. Such that an is now topic. on my list of books to yeah. buy. Great. <laughs> Thank Amazing. you. Julian, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Great show. I'll, I'll look forward to the other, other authors coming on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next up, we have Mandy Jackson Beverly, author of the creative series, A Dark Vampire Thriller. Ooh. Hi, Mandy. How Hello. are you? I'm good. Are you well, good. Well, yes. 
Yes, I'm very excited about anything vampire related, as I know Anastasia yeah. is. Yeah, Bathory is like my well, good. Uh, home girl. I don't know if oh. I should have said that. <laughs> Well, I write I write very uh, they're vampire books, but they are about art and the power of art. I think one person said that uh, it's kind of like having a soup art as a superpower. So that was nice, which is kind of the way I see art, which is great. True. Yeah. True. All right. Now I really want to read it because <laughs> I love art too. Good. So I'm super excited, and I know you're going to read us a ghost story. Um, I am. But before that, I just want to ask you, um, you host the Bookshop podcast. I do. Um, and that helps sort of promote indie bookshops and communities, um, which I love yes. so much. So tell us about that. Yeah, it is. Well, during COVID, I just thought, oh, my God, there's so many independent bookshops closing. And I was really concerned about it. So I thought, what can I do? And so I started the Bookshop podcast, specifically interviewing owners of, um, you know, independent bookshops, and then authors as well. And then now what I do is I also have a Wednesday edition, which covers people in the humanities and the environment, because they're two of my kind of subjects that I love. And I used to have a speaker series before COVID, and I don't have that now. So this was a really good way to do it. So what people can do is I'll read part one. It's about eight minutes. So I, I need to get a move on with that. And then part two, um, they can go on to episode 22 and listen to it there. But before I go, I do want to say that if anybody listening would like a free copy of any of my books, and I have four in the series, oh, The Secret Muse, The Devil and the Muse, the Immortal Muse, and this one, which is a novella, The Legend of Astrodar. Um, just email me at mandy at cricketpublishing.org and I will send you a free Moby or an EPUB copy. That's because it's the book fest and I love readers and that's my part. So thank you. And thank you, Desiree. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Okay, I'm excited for this ghost story. So we're going to take ourselves okay. out here. Good. And so I this is a true story and it happened to me when I was quite young, okay? It was 1977 when the house called to me. It sat on a hill, surrounded by a neglected English garden, pastures and sheep. Australian eucalypts, or widow makers as they're commonly known, bordered a narrow dirt road leading to the driveway. Reddish brown paint peeled from well-worn weatherboards. The rambling house needed love, or well, that's what I thought. My best friend Janine had taken a bedroom opposite mine at the front of the house. Our two other roommates were unofficial lovers and kept a room for liaisons. As they were gone most of the time, this arrangement suited us all. Janine's cat also moved in, as did mine, along with my dog, a boxer named Holly. The original house had consisted of three rooms, but with the passing of a century, it had grown to eight one of which shared a wall with my bedroom. This room seemed like an odd addition as it could only be accessed by an exterior door. So we used it to store boxes and gardening stuff. The door was kept closed to keep possums and snakes from getting in there. The house's strange configuration meant that one room, which we used as a dining room, lacked windows. And above a fireplace stood a solid wooden mantle, above which I hung a gift from my parents, a large oval mirror, plaster carved and painted gold. Janine placed various trinkets she'd collected, delicate wedgewood pieces and glass animals on the shelf below the mirror. To the right of the front door was a living area with a door leading out to a small patio and the storage room where we kept the boxes. There were fireplaces in all of the rooms. I didn't use the one in my bedroom, but instead I placed an antique ceramic bed warmer in the grate. The walls of my bedroom were adorned with Pink Floyd and John Lennon posters, my guitar and tie-dyed fabrics. One Saturday evening while Janine and I drank wine in the living room, we discussed how we'd both noticed an unusual influx of large huntsman spiders in the house. Our conversation was interrupted by a loud smashing noise, followed by an eerie silence. It wasn't so much the disturbance that frightened me, but rather the deep sense of anger roiling through the house like a sandstorm. 
What the hell was that? Janine whispered. I shook my head, drank the remains of my red wine in my glass and placed it on a table. I motioned to a fire poker in the corner, which she grabbed and promptly handed to me. Meanwhile, she armed herself with a dustpan and small broom. I'm not sure quite why. We peered around the living room door, crept along the hallway and into the dining room. A cloud of dust smoke sparkled in the dim light, filtering in from the kitchen. I flicked on a light switch. Strewn all over the floor lay the remains of my gold mirror, fragments of plaster along with God knows how many years of bad luck. Janine's trinkets sat undisturbed on the mantel. Had my mirror simply fallen, it would have taken most of her treasures along with it. However, the nail that held the mirror was still on the wall. My mirror hadn't fallen. Somebody threw it. On cue, thousands of tiny spiders ran out of cracks on the wall and above the mount mantel and spread out like an army over the dining room walls. Janine and I screamed, not so much from the event transpiring before us, but rather from the icy chill in the atmosphere and the sheer sense of terror seeping like mist into our souls. I ran to my bedroom, grabbed my keys, and when I arrived back in the living room, Janine was laughing hysterically. Mad laughter was her defense mechanism, how she acted in an emergency. I grabbed her hand, hightailed it outside, into my car, and drove to the next farm, which happened to be my parents' home. The next day, Mum helped us clean up, the sun shone, and for a while, things settled down, but not for long. The racket began shortly after midnight. It sounded like the boxes in the outside storage room were being tossed around. Bloody possums, I whispered and opened my eyes. Four eyes stared at me, but a paw in my face alerted the adrenaline spike rushing throughout my body to dissipate. Cat and dog trembled, hair raised on their backs. An abrupt crashing noise made me jump. The cat leaped into the air and landed across the room. The dog whimpered. I eased myself into a sitting position and saw that something had fallen down the chimney, smashing my antiquity. I expected a possum to appear through the mess, but when that didn't happen and I recognized the chill in the room, I froze and listened. The noise from the back room grew louder, violent and angry, and I slipped out of bed, crept commando style across the room, opened the door and made a beeline across the hall to Janine's bedroom. One thing about Janine, she could sleep through anything. Aliens landing in the backyard, the apocalypse, dinner. She needed her 10 hours of sleep. I whisper yelled, Janine. I poked her in the arm, nothing. I shook her violently. What's going? My hand across her mouth silenced her. Listen to me. I think someone's room. I think it was a possum. But now I'm not sure. If I take my hand away, don't scream. She nodded and I removed my hand. She giggled. I slapped her quickly across the face. She sat up, pulled on her sheer black robe, trimmed with feathers around the wrist, and slipped on her fluffy high-heeled slippers. She looked like a hooker on vacation. Let's go back to the living room, she said. See what's going on outside. We crept up the hallway, arm in arm, and into the living room. Janine tilted her head. Geez, that doesn't sound like a possum redecorating. And if it is, here's an angry bugger. I swear this freaking house is haunted. We glanced through the windows and noticed the door to the storage room was closed. That's odd, I said. I guess the possum wants privacy, Janine said. Her eyes widened and she grinned. I shoved my hand over her mouth again. Stop it. This is serious. She nodded and I lowered my hand. What are we going to do? She asked. Should I get my keys? I looked around the room, my gaze resting on a broom. Well, we could use this as a battering ram. She nodded, picked up the broom and quietly opened the glass door and we tiptoed outside with her in the lead. On the count of three, Janine said. It seemed my threat of another slap had kicked her into ninja mode. One, two, three. We shoved the broom into the door and it flew open. Both of us ran back inside the living room, closed the door and looked through the windows. I'm not sure what we expected to see running out, 
but when nothing appeared and the noise stopped, we walked outside and entered the spare room. Janine switched on the light. What greeted us was perhaps more terrifying than seeing a deranged possum or a psychopath. The room was in perfect order. Not one box had moved. Everything looked organized. I rubbed my hands and arms from the chilled air. I don't remember who switched off the light and closed the door, but I do remember both of us brand drinking brandy huddled on together on the floor of, in front of our heater with our four-legged companions waiting for dawn. We left the house on the hill and moved into the city to a place with its own story. Sometimes there is no explanation for disturbances in the night or a whisper of air caressing the hair on the back of your neck. Perhaps they are the memories of others embedded in the atmosphere or spirits stuck within a meaningful moment of their life, searching, needing, craving life forever. Ooh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am so, that's so awesome. Good. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> we oh did. my gosh. Absolutely. Good. Good. Well, awesome. oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Mandy, thank you so much. You're that welcome. was so cool. Great. Thanks for having me and have a safe night. <laughs> oh, we'll try. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. So finally, last up, we have Debbie, Debbie Montasia. And she's going to read a poem for us. Hi, Debbie. Hi, how are you? Very I'm good. Still well. I'm still absorbing that ghost story. I know, right? <laughs> I know. It's yeah. almost nighttime. Oh, I mean, that was really good. I would just like to tell you that my cat jumped up here while she was reading. So well, maybe she knows something I don't. Is but. it a cat? Um, black and white. Yeah, she's uh, here, come here, peanuts. It's perfect. It's it's right on. And and there's something behind you. I'm just kidding. There's nothing behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so excited to hear your poem. And um... well, I have a couple I would like to read. Yes, and I'm going to read them out of my book. It's called Tears of Change. Okay. And they are. I have several poems in here that I wrote over the past uh, many years on life lessons and experiences, and they touch a variety of our emotions, happy, joyful, love, sorrow. And so I would like to read, um, one of them is called A Child's World. And A Child's World is actually spoken from a child's view to their parents. And I almost look at it as like a child's creed. And it goes like this, child's world. I'm only a child, please watch me grow. Teach me the things that I need to know. My world is little I can't yet see. My journey in life, my destiny. Guide me now when I am small. It's these years that count the most of all. When you scold, it's hard to understand. Punish me with a guiding hand. Not one that hits or hurts my pride. Let me know you are on my side. When I am wrong, politely tell me so. Do not yell, I have no other place to go. Be kind to me, you must see, I'm not a perfect entity. The mistakes I make, my messes unclean, are my stepping stones to learn and succeed. The tidiness can be altered a bit, but the adventure in me must never quit. Read with me, write with me, sing with me too. These are the things that I like to do. It's quality time, necessity to pursue. It's important right now that I lean on you. Please give me all the love I need. It nourishes me, it puts me at ease. Hugs and kisses, they are the best. Their gentleness assures me that I am blessed. I'm only a child, please watch me grow. Soon I'll be an adult and then I'll know the love and togetherness that we shared will bring me lifelong happiness because I knew you cared. So oh, that's beautiful. beautiful. That's, I always like to uh, end that poem with, you know, I like to have parents realize that it's so important that our external voices when we're raising our kids can become their internal voices. So absolutely. Really yep. Really powerful when, when raising kids, I have two, I'm, they're older now, but um, it was a good journey raising them and being a mom. And it's one of my best accomplishments and I'm still loving them as they're older as an empty nester. <laughs> love that. Love that. Yeah. Uh, amazing. That was wonderful. And you're reading another one, right? Yes. So the next awesome. one is more on contemplation um, and nature. It's called The Weeping Willow. It's one of my favorite trees. And this one uh, goes like this. Have you ever seen a tree so tall? Has it reached its highest peak? 
The branches droop so soft and serene. Does a weeping willow weep? Is it tears that make the trees so lush, the luster of its slender leaves? I don't think a tree would grieve. It's only there to please. Its beauty and its slender casts a glow, or its beauty and its shadow cast a glow in late afternoon. When nighttime falls, the willows sway beneath the peaceful moon. When dawn arrives, the specks of dew embrace each delicate leaf. That's why one might say, a weeping willow weeps. The wind whispers through each willow as the branches swing to and fro, a marvel of God's creation as we watch this willow grow. Oh, that's lovely. I love a willow too, so. I know, aren't they pretty? They're my favorite so pretty. <laughs> I know. I always think of wind, of the, wind in the willows, um, I, and I age myself so much. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, no, if it makes you feel better, um, the kids in my neighborhood used to pick up willow switches and smack each other with them. Yes, that's, that, that could be an issue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I love them, not the, that part, but yeah. yeah. So my hope, you know, I wrote this book uh, uh, for, to give hope and inspiration for people. And I also wanted to share with, um, with the readers, I, what birthed this book was actually me going through my anxiety. And that's where the title comes from, Tears of Change. I was actually writing about sadness. And as I worked through all my sadness, through my anxiety, there is a way out, folks, if you do have anxiety. And I found my tears of joy and happiness. So that's where the, um, oh, you can't see it. So that's where the uh, title of the book. And then like one side of the tree is barren and the other side is lush. Oh, I love well, I'm that. Well versed in anxiety. So this is, this, what, a, what a beautiful way to get your emotions out and, and right. to produce such beauty. So I, I must say though, I love Celeste. Um, I don't think my poem will be on a, a, a wall in Phoenix. <laughs> but you never know. I know. Celeste didn't believe that either. And sure. now she's on a, a whole building. <laughs> I know. I need to go find that because I'm in Phoenix as well. Oh, amazing. I think yeah. poetry should be on every bit building. Let's make it happen, you guys. <laughs> you know, I, I come from a place that had a Walt Whitman. Yes. Um, a Walt Whitman Mall in Long Island. And they have his, they have his work across the front of the mall. So you never know. know. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on poetry, which seems to be having a resurgence right now. Um, you know, particularly from what we saw at the inauguration, but just, just in general, people seem to be rediscovering it. Oh yes, Amanda Gorman, isn't she amazing? Oh my God. Oh, what a prodigy. I look at her and I'm on a guide. I'm like, oh, she's just so amazing. <laughs> but there's a lot of amazing poets out there. Yes, I think there is a resurgence. Um, there's, I don't know if, have you ever uh, heard of NQ, Inquire Within? No. He's, he's quite amazing. He's out there. He just started a podcast and he's been interviewing a lot of uh, poets, younger poets. Poetry right now, it's more of a slam type, um, hip hop type it's, my, my poetry feels a little bit more traditional. This generation's pro poetry is a little bit different, but I really enjoy reading it. It's, um, it has a lot of meaning. You know, poetry, it, it's powerful. It carries a lot of emotions and it comes from the heart. It doesn't come from the intellect or the ego. And sometimes it's, it's hard for people to express and reach the places in their heart that they need to reach. And that's why another reason why I kind of wanted to get this book out there is my hope was that I, many or just one of my poems in it uh, would have helped the reader explore their emotions so they could reach a deeper place of love and gratitude within themselves. And because um, I think so many times we did, and especially with technology and the internet and everything going on right now, we always seem to be in our, in our heads. <laughs> we don't give, we don't give our heart time. And that, I really believe that's where true happiness comes. And I just hope that uh, my book can inspire people to bring them to that place. You can celebrate mom. Mother's Day is coming May 9th. <laughs> so. What a beautiful gift, right? Yeah, because I have, well, that's why I wanted to read Child's World, because I think that's a child's creed that could be in every room. And there's, there's another uh, book on girl. It's when um, you be, the mom and dad become empty nesters, which is huge. That was really hard for me when the kids leave, because, you know, all of a sudden they're there and then they're just gone. <laughs> it's hard. And I know a lot of moms have a hard time dealing with that as well. So I have a poem about that. And I have poems, I have just other little inspirational poems that are fun to read. I, I designed it to be a table book. So you can, I tell a little bit of a story in the front with about my anxiety, and then you can read it from the front all the way to the back, or you can just leave it on the table and pick up a poem and, or pick up a book and read a poem for a little bit of inspiration one day, depending on where you're at. 
you know. Amazing. We do have a question before we wrap up. Hey. Uh, Annie from Portland says, I love your poems and will gift your book to my mom for Mother's Day. Oh. Have you ever considered writing short stories or novels? Oh, you're funny. I had someone else asking me that. Uh, one of my neighbors, she said, you need to write short stories. And I went, uh, she goes, your poetry reads like a short story. You know, I haven't. And now that you say that, Anastasia, I can appreciate that. I, I'm going to give it a little bit more thought. I just need to sit down and, and just probably manifest it and sit down and start writing. Because that's where the poetry, you know, comes from. You just have to, I, you can't think about it too much because then you get writer's block. Yep. I know the writers are like that. You just kind of have to sit down and just start scribbling and let it flow. And maybe I can get it. Yeah. So thank you. I'll read it. Can you write it? I'll read it. Uh, yeah. I'll write it. Can you read it? Okay. I, think you, I think you have some stories there to tell for sure. For sure. So I probably uh, do. I think we yeah. all do. That's what my neighbor had said. She said, you know, she said so many people have stories to tell and they don't know how to tell them. So, but you know how to tell them. So you should interview those people and tell them and write them. So that's another avenue where Not I Not a bad idea. Yeah, I thought uh, I was up for an online class to kind of, you know, spoof me up a little bit with my writing skills. Never hurts to to gain more knowledge, right? That's totally. true. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you so much for sharing oh, such yes. beautiful words with us. Um, I know we uh, we have Mother's Day gifts to give out now. <laughs> yes, 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 the, yes. Desiree's going to come on in. Um, and talk about our, our grand prize winners. And yeah. Debbie, thank you so much. That was lovely. That was absolutely lovely. Thank you so much, Jen and Anastasia. I enjoyed meeting you and I love this event. It was an amazing day. I tuned into the whole day. Yay. Oh, awesome. Thank awesome. You so thank much. you. Bye-bye.